Well, this is the second Sunday of Lent. Unfortunately, I was not able to be here last week. Thank you all for welcoming my friend Kelly as preacher and leading in communion. Glad that she could be here with us. Uh, but we, I intended to start a sermon series on Romans last week, uh, following up on our sermon series in Exodus. And one of my goals by preaching from Exodus and Romans back to back is that we will see that they are actually two stories in parallel, told at different times in history, from different places in the ancient world, but still telling the story of God's people who need salvation from slavery and from bondage, the God who saves them and who leads them into a life of freedom. You know, in our last sermon in the series on Exodus, we talked about how the Israelites crossed the Jordan into the promised land, but how they were not there yet, how they had so much more to learn about how to live in freedom. And as we read Romans, we're going to read some passages that may be familiar to many of us, but we may be accustomed to interpreting them in a way that says, oh, well, these are passages about how God saves us in the sense of how God brings us from this side of the line, from being a sinner, to this side of the line of being saved. My challenge to us is to try to hear these familiar passages from the letter to the Romans in a new light. That is that it's not just about us as Christians crossing a line from unsaved to saved, but it's a letter to a church from Paul to the church in Rome teaching them how to live as people who have been set free from bondage to sin and bondage to idolatry and bondage to broken relationships who have been set free to live in the Spirit, to live in step with the Spirit, with minds guided by the Spirit. So it's a letter about how to live in a new land of freedom. So that for us is my encouragement to not hear it, even though we may have heard sermons on these passages many times, to try to hear it in a new light. In Exodus, we reflected on the God who saves. And in Romans, we're really doing the same thing. This is the God who saves. My hope is that this sermon series in Romans will clarify our theological picture of how we understand who God is and what language we use to talk about our God. And in doing so, I hope we see how consistent our picture of God can be between Exodus and Romans, between what we call the Old Testament or the Hebrew Scriptures and the New Testament picture of God. Our picture of Yahweh, the God who saved Israel from slavery and led them to the promised land, and Jesus of Nazareth, who led a small band of disciples around Galilee and then ended up on the cross and at the empty grave, that we are looking at the same God in all of those stories. Today's sermon will come in a few parts because I'm catching up a little bit from missing last week, but it'll really be an introduction to the book of Romans and also to this idea that we need the good news that Paul spends the entire letter of Romans explaining. So with that in mind, we begin reading from Romans chapter 1, verse 1, and we'll read the first seven verses and then jump down a little bit in chapter 1. Listen to how Paul introduces himself to the church in Rome. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The gospel concerning his son, who was descended from David, according to the flesh, and was declared to be son of God, with power according to the spirit of holiness, by resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship, to bring about obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for the sake of his name, including yourselves who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all God's beloved in Rome who are called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's Paul's greeting. Now there's a lot of theology in there which we'll get to, but I want you to notice that was one sentence. So have mercy on me as I'm trying to read this <laughs> out loud. So that's Paul's greeting to the church in Rome, and then we jump down to verse 16 as Paul really summarizes what this whole letter ahead is going to be about. And he writes this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile, to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith. As it is written, the one who is righteous will live by faith. We're going to pause there as we go on because I want us to understand 
who Paul is that is writing this letter and to whom he is writing in the church of Rome and then really what he's doing with this introductory summation of the letter. In the very first verse of Romans, Paul introduces himself in theological terms because he understands himself in theological terms. And we can all learn something from how Paul introduces himself. First, he says, I am a servant, a slave of Jesus Christ. In other words, saying Jesus Christ is my master, my Lord, my king, the one from whom I take marching orders. Paul's introducing himself by his own decision to serve Christ with his life. A decision that was really made for him when Jesus encountered him on the road to Damascus. But what if we introduced ourselves that way? Hi, I'm Andrew, a servant of Jesus Christ. Or I'm Karen, a servant of Jesus Christ. How would that define our relationships here in the church and beyond? Second, Paul writes that he is called by God to be an apostle. An apostle in Greek is really just a word for one who is sent out. You see, Paul had a missionary purpose. He was sent to bring the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, especially to those who were not Jewish, to those who are Gentiles, the rest of the world who did not have a history of life with Yahweh, God of Israel. This letter is far enough into Paul's career of apostleship that the church in Rome, even though he's never been there, had probably heard of him. They were familiar with all the other churches he had planted. And he's saying, this is my identity. Forget what I've done in the past or what my last name is. Who I am is a servant of Christ and one who is sent to found new churches in Christ's name. And finally, Paul identifies himself as set apart for the gospel of God. He says, this is the unique purpose that I have in everything I'm doing in my life. To proclaim the good news that God has given to us. To spread the gospel that comes from God about the life of death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. What we'll focus on as we introduce ourselves to Paul's letter to the Romans is what that gospel, what that good news is. So as we open Romans, we are reminded about who Paul the author is. He is ethnically and religiously Jewish. He writes in Galatians chapter 1 that he was extra zealous, more zealous than his peers in the traditions of his ancestors. He was trained by a leading rabbi to become a religious professional himself. And we know from the story in the book of Acts that he was actively persecuting the church, the first generations of those who followed Jesus. When Jesus himself, the resurrected Lord, encountered him on the road to Damascus and turned his life around. The book of Romans, we're really focusing on the first half of the book now through Easter, is about how God turns our lives around. And it's so important for us to see that Paul, the author, has had this experience of repentance and transformation in a totally new direction of his life, as we know in the story of the road to Damascus. He went from being a persecutor of the early church to the greatest promoter of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the ancient world. In this opening paragraph, after he introduces himself in verses 1 through 7, Paul goes on to begin to introduce the good news, which is the message of the letter to the Romans. The good news, Paul writes, is the fulfillment of everything we have read and are familiar with in the Old Testament stories. The story of God freeing his people in the Exodus. The story of the law, all that we find in Exodus and Numbers and Leviticus and Deuteronomy. The story of God's covenant promises to his people generation after generation, that has been fulfilled in a dramatic climax through Jesus Christ. Jesus, who is in the long line of the kings of Israel and a descendant of David. This same Jesus who lived with power as he fed the hungry, healed the sick, and we saw the greatest demonstration of God's power as Jesus was raised from the dead, which is a theme that Paul will keep coming back to. It is this Jesus Christ, our Lord, Paul's master and our master, who has made salvation available to all people. And this is what Paul's good news is about. It's about how Jesus makes it possible for all who trust in God to go from slavery into freedom. How to live in this land as free people. Now we don't know a lot of details about 
the church in Rome, except we know that Paul has never been there before. He says as much further down in Romans chapter 1. But he has heard of them. It's already an established church. We know it's a church that includes both Jewish and Gentile believers because the letter addresses some of the tensions held in a church that would have included both. And like any church in the first generation of the Christian movement, they were still figuring out their theology. They were trying to put together the long history of Israel and God's covenant promises with the dramatic events that had happened in a very short period of time in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. They were trying to interpret real historical events that they had heard about in first and second-hand accounts in this first generation of believers after Jesus' death and resurrection. And it's clear that one of Paul's purposes is to write to this church and to say, here's what I want you to know about how this all took place. It's to give a theological explanation, but it's a theological explanation that makes sense of the greater story of Scripture that we study every Sunday when we gather together. This letter to the Romans has become known as a theological centerpiece of the New Testament. But sometimes it's tempting for us as we study Paul's letters, and especially Romans, to say, oh, well, here's what Paul says, but then what about what happens over here in the Gospels and what Jesus says? What I want us to see is that they actually work together in a complementary fashion. The Gospels tell the story of Jesus' life and death and resurrection, and in doing so, they give us a very clear Jesus-centered or Christocentric theology of what God is doing and how we discover God in the story of Jesus. And what Paul does in Romans is he's a bit more expository. He shows us, here's the theology of what happened, but it also has a narrative arc. And as you'll see in coming chapters, Paul retells the history of God's covenant people Israel so that we can come to a complete understanding of how Jesus brought to a climax that long story of God and his covenant relationship with the people of Israel. They go side by side. We get to Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, where Paul offers us a summary of all else that will follow in the letter to the Romans. Paul declares that he is not ashamed of the gospel, and then explains in powerful phrasing just what this good news is. But I want us to understand that even this term gospel or good news is a technical term from the Roman Empire. It was a proclamation that something good had happened for the king or the emperor or his armed forces wherever they were doing battle. So imagine if that you were in the church in Rome and you knew that the empire was expanding, you know, a thousand miles to the east and trying to conquer a new city and that army had a victory... Well, a series of runners would make their way all the way back to Rome, and then there would be a proclamation of that military victory. And that proclamation was known as euangelion, or good news. The king had a victory, the kingdom expanded, and therefore the people are better off. That's what good news, or gospel, is. But in Paul's time, people were used to hearing good news that was only about the emperor in Rome. And Paul says, I have the gospel of God for you, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is good news about specific things that happened, actions that God has taken in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus that change our fate and our fortune. And we are better off as citizens of God's kingdom because of it. I am not afraid of this good news that I proclaim to you. Paul starts his letter by saying, this good news is about a victory that has been won by God for the sake of God's people. It's a victory over sin and evil and death. And this is why we are choosing to study Romans in the season of Lent. It's because as we approach the cross, what happens on Good Friday and Easter morning, we'll have a clearer picture of that story. It's because we understand this theological explanation that Paul offers 20 or 30 years after those events. Paul goes on to write that the good news is the power of God for salvation of everyone who believes. First for the Jews, then for the Greeks. And by saying first for the Jews and then for the Greeks, Paul is saying this is good news for everyone. Those who've had a long history of relationship with God, Yahweh, and what he has done for his covenant people. And those for whom this is a brand new story that they are stepping into. This is good news for everyone, no matter their ethnic background or their country of origin or the language of their birth. It is good news for both religious insiders those who are not 
with us here in church this morning, including many of our neighbors here in Redmond. Something I hope we discover as we study the book of Romans is what Irv was talking about on Wednesday night, is how do we take the good news of Jesus Christ, see it at work in our own lives here and now this week, and share that good news with those around us. Good news of what God has done for us. Good news for everyone. Paul says in verse 17, it is good news, the good news is that the righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith. In Greek, that last phrase reads more like from faith to faith. And there are entire chapters and books and commentaries that fill seminary libraries trying to explain Romans 1.17. And here's my very brief one minute explanation because I think it frames how we go on to read the entire book of Romans. Because Romans says a lot about how we are saved by grace through faith, and it forces us to think a lot about what role does our faith, our confident relationship of trust with God, play in the story of salvation. In 117, where Paul writes that it is from faith to faith, what I believe he is talking about is God's faithfulness to God's covenant promises to Israel, which then apply to all people because of what happened in Jesus Christ. So faith, one definition of faith is fidelity or faithfulness or accomplishing, doing what we said we would do. That's part of being faithful. So the first step of salvation is not some trust that we put in God. It's God's faithfulness to us. It's God's faithfulness to his covenant promises. It's God's fidelity as seen in what Jesus Christ did in his life, death, and resurrection. God is faithful. Then our faith is simply walking across the bridge of God's faithfulness, trusting that the bridge will hold. You see, when we walk across a bridge over a chasm or a canyon, it doesn't matter how much we trust that that bridge is going to hold. What matters is the architecture of that bridge. So what's most important is not how much faith we can put in God. What's most important is how faithful our God is. The fact that the bridge is strong and will hold as we walk across Therefore, we trust because God is trustworthy. So from faith, from God's faithfulness to our faith or our trust in God. What we'll see unfold as we explore Romans 1 through 8, and you're welcome to keep reading past that though, it's a story of God's faithfulness. Whenever Paul's talking about God's righteousness or the righteousness seen in Jesus Christ, it's God acting faithfully to his covenant promises. That's what God's righteousness looks like, is God doing what God says he would do. We put our faith in that. All this so far has really been an introduction to Paul and his introduction to the letter of Romans in the first half of chapter 1. As we, if we were to keep going in chapter 1, we'd see Paul's explanation of sin and the condition of sinfulness that affects all of humanity And I was really disappointed because I wanted to preach a whole sermon on sin last week. But I got called away uh, to be with family in Wisconsin. So you missed my sermon on sin. But you can read it. And what you'll see as you read in Romans chapter 1 further on is that Paul gives a lot of ways of talking about sin. And it's helpful for us to think there's not just one definition of sinfulness. First, yes, we all have an individual role to play in sinfulness. But what Paul's talking about is a collective condition of humanity that we all share. Those of us inside the church and outside the church, we're all subject to this kind of sinfulness. And it reveals itself when we are caught up in deception instead of truth. It reveals itself when we are caught up in idolatry instead of worshiping the true God. Paul has a lot to say about idolatry, of putting anything that is created in between ourselves and the creator. Sin is also revealed in our collective humanity. When we see all the broken ways we interact with each other in broken relationships. That is the web of sinfulness that we are all caught up in. Yes, we have specific actions, what I like to refer to as stealing cookies from the cookie jar. Those are sins, and we need to apologize for them. We need to repent. We need to seek forgiveness. But there's a deeper condition that affects all of us. Being caught up in the mess of humanity that we've all inherited and that we all contribute to. Now the thing is, whenever we start talking about sin in the context of the church, 
<laughs> we first start to look at each other. And we notice our neighbor's sinfulness. Or we notice the person on the other side of the political aisle's sinfulness. Or we notice someone else in another country's sinfulness. And Paul knows that this is part of the trap of sinfulness. And to address this idea that we always look outward when we start talking about sin, Paul says this at the beginning of Romans chapter 2, verse 1. That's where we're going next. There we go. Paul says this to those of us who are more likely to point our fingers outward when we talk about sin. He says, Therefore, you have no excuse, whoever you are, when you judge others. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, are doing the very same things. You say, we know that God's judgment on those who do such things is in accordance with the truth. You imagine, whoever you are, that when you judge those who do such things and yet do them yourself, you will escape the judgment of God. Or do you despise the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience? Do you not realize that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? So one of the key messages Paul has for us as we begin looking at the book of Romans is that it's not just those people out there who need good news or need the gospel. It's us. We all desperately need to be evangelized. We all need good news. We are all just as liable to get caught up in sins of deception and idolatry and broken relationship, hurting other people with our words and actions. We need to be set free from what binds us to those things. We are all just as enslaved. And this is why, as we examine Romans, I want us to kind of get past perhaps some of our earlier theologies that convinced us that salvation was just about getting from this side of the line to that side of the line. Because we all need this good news over and over and over again. There's a lot of reasons we worship every Sunday, but one of them, I think, is because we need to hear the good news every seven days. We start to forget how much we need that good news. Paul, being just as human as the rest of us, is aware of our tendency to look at the mess of our lives and the mess of our world and to point the blame outwards. You know, in the fall, we read from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and there are several Sundays in a row where I said, this is Jesus' toughest teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, and we'd say it again the next week. But one of those was Jesus teaching to not judge, or you yourself will be judged. And we all know this. And there's a lot of ways we can demonstrate the way of Christ that will stand out in our world right here, right now. Especially in our time of political fracturing. And hear Paul's instruction that echo Jesus' instruction to not judge. Which is to recognize that we are all equally fallible, equally liable to idolatry. And to not be casting our judgments unfairly on others. But to recognize that we are all equally desperately in need of God's grace in our lives. As Paul writes, God's kindness and forbearance and patience ought to lead us to repentance. We need to recognize how we mess up and how much we need grace. And that's why we bring it in a prayer of confession and reconciliation each week. It's why we proclaim the good news of forgiveness and grace every week in our worship. Because God's grace leads us to repentance. We all need this good news. Well, the sermon I was planning on preaching this week would start here. But don't worry, I'm not going to keep you for another half hour. (laughs) But I do want us to read together from Romans chapter 3. Because it's really the next step Paul takes in understanding what the good news is about. We won't get into all the complexities of law and grace, but what I want us to hear in these verses from Romans chapter 3 is this. Romans 3.23 is probably one of the most familiar verses on sin that many of us memorized at an earlier stage of life. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But I want you to notice that it is sandwiched by words of God's grace and faithfulness for us. So hear this way of Paul describing the good news of grace. Romans 3.21 But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God, God's faithfulness to his promises, has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ is for all who believe. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by God's grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. 
He did this to show his righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that God himself is righteous, and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of boasting? It is excluded. By what law? By that of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. So is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one and he will justify the circumcised on the ground of faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. For some reason, many of us were taught to memorize Romans 3.23 and make sure that we knew that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, me, you, all of us. But I'll tell you what, after graduating seminary 10 years ago and being active in church leadership for the last decade, I discovered this week that that verse is sandwiched by grace. And as we begin reading Romans, what I want us to notice is that, yes, we need to come to terms with our own need for salvation and grace and the freedom offered to us in Jesus Christ. But that need is always sandwiched by grace. Romans 3.22 says the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ is for all who believe. Then the familiar verse, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then Paul follows it up, for they are now justified by God's grace as a gift, a pure gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. As we open the book of Romans, and we have lots more to look at and celebrate together about God's grace in coming weeks, but as we open it, what we notice is that we are all at the same starting place of our relationship with God. And by all of us, I mean those of us here inside the church and our neighbors out there going for a run and enjoying brunch, is that we have all sinned and fallen short of God's grace. But God's grace is there for us and with us. The story of God's great movement of freedom for the people of God that goes all the way back to Exodus and continues in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is a story of incredible grace that is a pure gift for us. As Paul says so clearly, this is not about the law or works. There is no amount of good deeds or obedient gestures that we can do that would get us to this place of relationship with God that God has accomplished for us by grace. Because of God's righteousness, his faithful fulfilling of his covenant promises. Because of that, we begin to see unfold before us the beautiful and challenging letter of Paul to the Romans that sets before us. But that will remind us over and over again that God's love for us is greater than the hold of sin or sinfulness on our lives. God's power displayed in the resurrection is what sets us free to live in Christ from here forward, to discover this free land in front of us, this promised land, this beloved country, where we are given the gift of freedom to live by the Spirit, to live in step with the Spirit. Left to our own devices, those of us who are captive to sin, that's all of us, we would just keep going in the direction of sin, which is the direction of hurt and broken relationships, the direction of idolatry, the direction of death, as Paul will say. But because of God's grace for us, our course and our trajectory has been turned around so that we can live not slaves to sin, but slaves to righteousness, servants of Jesus Christ, and in freedom that God has promised us. Our God has given us the great gift of redemption in Jesus Christ, the unfolding story of God's grace at work in our lives. We have been set free. Amen. Let us pray together. God, we thank you for your incredible gift of grace. We thank you that you have set us free from all that enslaves us and that uh, exerts bondage on us. That you have done more than just bring us across a line, but you have given us a whole promised land to explore what it means to live in freedom as we live with your spirit alive and at work in us. God, would your spirit dig around in our own heart and minds today and make room for more grace as we discover more of our need for you. Would your grace be transformative in our lives, leading us forward to extend good news and grace to everyone around us. In the name of Christ we pray.
Amen.